And I will start, I mean, uh, quite a few of you were here in the first session when Brian and I tried to cover, uh, to give an overview of CLL. So I apologize if you are seeing these slides for a second time. So the question and the challenge and that my task here is to try to give an overview about how we make a diagnosis of CLL. And I will start with this. It's chronic because the disease course is prolonged. It's lymphocytic because the cell that is suffering, the cell that went crazy and gave rise to this tumor is a lymphocyte, a kind of white blood cell. And finally, it's leukemia. This is a nice Greek word. It means white blood because when you have plenty, plenty of white blood cells, your blood, if you let it stand, will appear white. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a very rare disease, four to five new cases per 100,000 individuals. This is the incidence in Europe and the US. This is the incidence among Caucasians, because if you go to the Far East, it's far less frequent there. And we shouldn't forget that it is a disease of aged individuals. This is the distribution of CLL patients according to age. So what you can see here is that, that this distribution is shifted to the right. In simpler words, the median age is 72. And although you have a proportion of cases diagnosed roughly one third below the age of 65, Still, we are talking about a disease of aged individuals. Now, chronic is easily and nicely, I guess, explained. If you look at this graph, which shows you that more than 80% of cases will be surviving after five years from the diagnosis. It's very different from other tumors. It's very different from other hematologic malignancies. And as we already said, we do not know what causes the disease. We have ideas. We have hypotheses. We know, for instance, that this is a disease where the affected cell communicates with the exterior and receives signals. These cells respond to the signals, but does not know where to stop. There is no way to prevent it. It's not contagious, but it is familial in that there are some families where you get more than one affected individual and the chances are much higher of having CLL if you have a, a relative who has it. As I said, it is a tumor of white blood cells, and white blood cells are one of the types of cells that we see in the blood. And these cells are produced in the bone marrow, and the bone marrow is a compartment within the, some bones. It's a lattice. You get stroma, you get supportive components, and you get cells, and one type of cell in the bone marrow is the blood stem cell. In other words, the progenitor of all types of cells that we see in the blood. Now, one of the types of cells that we see in the blood is a B lymphocyte. Lymphocytes are divided in three categories, B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and NK cells. The B lymphocyte is a major type of cell for defense, we cannot do without B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are producing Im immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins fight bacteria, fight viruses. B lymphocytes are doing a number of other important things, but the take home message is we cannot do without B lymphocytes. Now, the bone marrow is the site of the production of uh, white blood cells and any blood cell. And as I said, B lymphocytes are important for defense. And they recognize various things. And these things, we call them antigens. 
They recognize structures of antigens. We call them epitopes. Just think that this is a pathogen, a bacterium, a virus. It will be having various structures on its surface. We call these antigens. And some parts of these structures, which are called epitopes, are recognized specifically by B lymphocytes. The molecule that is important for this interaction is the immunoglobulin. This is the immunoglobulin, and this is a specific receptor for each B lymphocyte. Each B lymphocyte is uniquely identified by the immunoglobulin. Each of us is, has trillions, billions of different B lymphocytes, and each of them has a unique immunoglobulin. So if you want to speak about B lymphocytes, you could speak about immunoglobulins. It's as simple as that. Now, think about a leukemia. Think about a malignancy of B lymphocytes, like CLL. Does it make sense to you that we should be caring and studying the immunoglobulins? It's as simple as that. So when cells turn nasty, when B lymphocytes turn nasty, what happens is that we begin with a heterogeneous population. You have cells expressing gray, pink, green, black immunoglobulin. The black one, the black cell, happens to have, uh, the black cell is unlucky, becomes crazy, as I said, and starts dividing, multiplying. So in the end, we have a population of cells, a clone of cells. They will all be related. They will all have the same derivation. So they will all express the black immunoglobulin, meaning what? meaning that we will have many cells in the blood. So this is how normal blood looks like in the under the microscope, and this is what CLL looks like. So we will have many, many, many lymphocytes. Okay? Normally this is what you would see, and this is what you see if you examine the blood of a CLL patient. You find many, 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 many of these small bluish cells, these are lymphocytes. So, is this enough to call it chronic lymphocytic leukemia? The answer is a big no. Before we move on and explain about no, let's also think about symptoms. So, you've heard that CLL is a malignancy of one particular type of white blood cells. So when these multiply and when these expand, they can, you know, accumulate. And when they do this, they may really make it difficult for the stem cells in the bone marrow. And these poor stem cells they cannot produce red blood cells, and you may develop anemia. They are, it is difficult for them to produce platelets, and you may develop what we call thrombocytopenia, which means you have low platelets, and you may have increased risk of bleeding. But these malignant cells secrete a number of uh, different substances. We call them cytokines, and chemokines, and these substances make, a, make patients feel bad. They induce these flu-like symptoms. You can have other symptoms like loss of, of appetite or unexplained weight loss, but generally speaking, these are exceptional cases because the great, great majority of cases more than 8 to 85 percent 
will have no symptoms. Now, these malignant B lymphocytes, these dysfunctional B lymphocytes, no longer function normally. So the patients, they do have an increased risk for infections. These lymphocytes, when they accumulate in the organs, they may create swelling of lymph nodes. And because the spleen and the lymph nodes are two sites where lymphocytes normally reside, if you get an accumulation of B lymphocytes in the spleen and the lymph nodes, you will see enlargement of the spleen. You heard Brian say that you can feel like six months pregnant with this large spleen, or you can have swellings in the neck, swelling in the groin. Why? Because these locations, the neck, the groin, the spleen, are places where lymphocytes normally reside. So when they multiply, when they divide, when they proliferate, when they accumulate, they tend to accumulate in these locations. So now we've learned everything about the symptoms, but it is generally a symptomless disease. And how, what is the main reason that uh, somebody is referred for further investigations? It's an accidental finding of increased numbers of white blood cells. So you go for a regular checkup and then you are diagnosed with high white blood cells so somebody tells you it's a good idea to go to, uh, hema to a, you know, a place specializing in uh, hematology to see what, could, what the reason might be for this. What happens if you go to a specialized center or a physician knowledgeable about these diseases is that you will have, uh, somebody will examine the blood under the microscope. It's what I showed you five minutes ago. And what you will usually see is increased numbers of lymphocytes. But I've already told you this is not enough for establishing, establishing a diagnosis, and which is why the guidelines, the recommendations, request that a diagnosis is made only by this method called flow cytometry. This is a technique that allows the examination of the characteristics of cells. And we need a combination. We need to examine a combination of cell markers, of cell characteristics. There is a number of characteristics that are considered typical for CLL. But another thing that we need to document is that we have, and this is in fact the first thing that we need to document, is that we have a clonal population, a monoclonal population. Do you remember I showed you the green, pink, uh, black, gray cells? When you have CLL, the black cell will expand and, you know, outgrow everything. So you need to document that you have a clonal, a monoclonal population. And there is another thing that is requested, that we have at least 5,000 clonal B cells per milliliter of blood. Of course, this is really stupid and arbitrary, because what could happen if you have 4,900? Is it not a CLL? But that's how we do in medicine. Medicine is not science. Medicine is art and common sense. But medicine is also compromises. So we came up with this very stupid, I must say, definition. We call something that is below 5,000 cells monoclonal B lymphocytosis, hereafter MBL. And the question is, for many of us, can it be that CLL is always preceded by MBL? In other words, at the end of the spectrum, can it be that we CLL is one end of the spectrum and we are moving gradually there? 
Or is it that one day, all of a sudden, a cell becomes crazy and we get CLL? There is this amazing initiative in the United States. They call it the PLCO screening trial. They wanted to find biomarkers for prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer. PLCO, prostate, lung, colon, ovary. So they enrolled more than 75,000 healthy men and women aged between 55 and 75, and they were collecting blood at baseline and then annually up to six years. And then they were following up these individuals for the development of cancer. Now, within this group of individuals, this very large cohort, they had about 30 to 35 individuals diagnosed with CLL. And they had the very simple but clever idea. Can we go back to the freezers and, you know, take the blood samples that were collected some years ago and see if we can detect CLL cells before the diagnosis? And guess what? In every individual diagnosed with CLL, CLL cells were detected, were circulating in the blood years before. In some cases, even more than five years, which tells you that this is not all of a sudden, but rather a gradual process. Now, suppose that after doing everything, we have the blood examination, we have documented the clonal character of this expanded lymphocytes of these increased lymphocytes. So we have a monoclonal lymphocytic, B lymphocytic population with features that are typical for CLL. And now we have 22,000 clonal B cells. So we have a diagnosis of CLL. Do we need to do more things? So would we need to analyze the bone marrow? You could ask me why. And I could tell you, as I showed you five minutes ago, this is where the blood cells are produced. So would it make sense to analyze the bone marrow? And do we need to make a bone marrow biopsy? None of the above. It turns out that the correct answer is none of the above. So you can have a diagnosis of CLL with no other tests except for a complete blood cell count and a flow cytometry analysis. Okay? So, examination of the bone marrow is not needed a diagnosis. It's recommended, though, before you decide about treatment. Next steps, because you may have heard about CT scans, ultrasounds, MRIs, imaging in general. So if asked, would you do an ultra, would you recommend an ultrasound? If you asked me, would you recommend an ultrasound? You, would you recommend CT scans? None of the above or other tests, I would tell you none of the above. Because having complete blood cell count having examined the blood smear, so the morphology of the blood under the microscope, then having performed the flow cytometric analysis, and of course, after thoroughly examining the patient, you have all you need to be certain about the diagnosis, but also to offer your patient reliable information. There are clinical staging systems we call them RAI and Binet clinical staging systems. And by combining our hands and the information from the complete blood cell count, we get very meaningful information about this disease. And we get information about what we, we could expect, about how fast the disease will evolve. And as you understand, 
This is doable, easy, straightforward in India, the United States, Australia and Greece. And it's quite objective. The question though is more complicated. Is it enough? And the answer is no. This is a disease that is invisible, at least in the great majority of cases. You don't feel anything, you're doing well. You don't see anything, but still you have a disease inside your body. It's inconclusive because some patients may follow a very aggressive disease course and others live for decades without any problem, without treatment. And it's incurable even with all the exciting developments in the last decade, in the last five years. This creates a rather, you know, unique mix. And to make it more special, you have a tumor, you have a malignancy, and then in the great, great majority of cases, you will not receive treatment when you are diagnosed with a leukemia. And I've tried in this slide to show you a timeline, a usual timeline of CLL. So in about one third of cases, this expanded population, this clonal population will remain stable for years. But in the remaining two thirds of cases, the clone may become more aggressive. The clone may change. And when this happens, it's not only the tumor that will be different, but also the host. Suppose that I'm diagnosed with CLL, now I'm 52. And then after about six or seven years, the disease may progress and become more aggressive and I, I meet the criteria for treatment. I will need treatment. By that time, by the age of 60, I may have developed diabetes increased blood pressure, you name it. So we need to also remember this. So we, when it comes to assessing the prognosis, it's a big riddle and uh, we will not go to the Sphinx like Oedipus did in ancient Greece. We can do other things. We can start to think of what I call the interacting determinants in CLL and in directing determinants refer to the tumor but also to the microenvironment of the tumor and this tumor tumor microenvironment interaction is really critical for both understanding the biology of the disease but also treating the disease but we should not ignore the host and the overall physiology of the host in other words is it the same if Nick and I are both having CLL and Nick is active, has no medical problems, whereas I have diabetes, depression, and uh, kidney failure? Is it the same disease? And finally, what about Nick living an active, healthy life, exercising systematically, eating well, sleeping well? and I standing at home doing nothing, being simply depressed and, you know, being anxious about the disease. The final thing in particular is something that we are not taking into account, unfortunately. So when it comes to assessing the prognosis and predicting the response to treatment, we have done a lot, but despite all the amazing scientific developments, I should say that we are still far from being able to offer each individual patient a right message. And I will come back again to this aspect, behavioral, lifestyle, environmental factors and societal circumstances, because this is hugely overlooked 
And this is something where we need a very close interactions be interaction between patients and physicians. Otherwise, we will never address the problem. In simpler words, thorough understanding of CLL evolution requires a comprehensive approach. And since it is chronic, heterogeneous, and unpredictable, we need to find ways to address all these major challenges, in particular, the unpredictability. Because unpredictability creates stress, creates, you know, anxiety. So we need to find ways, because for me, you've asked me to cover diagnosis of CLL, but along with the diagnosis comes anxiety, fear, so it's part of the same thing. And in CLL in particular, the challenges are plenty and quite different from other cancers because we have the issues of chronic illness versus uncertainty, and we have the issues of the necessary adaptations in your life when you have all of a sudden a landmark, which is leukemia with no symptoms and no signs, in most cases at least. And of course this is happening not only in CLL but in every disease. So the physician and his or her style of communication may impact on various things from the adherence to treatment to patient satisfaction with care to medical outcome. And studies in CLL in particular from the Mayo Clinic, it's a large study led by Tate Schoenfeld, more than 1,400 individuals, patients with CLL. This study has shown that uh, patient satisfaction is clearly linked to the effectiveness of the communication and associated with high overall and emotional quality of life and the effectiveness uh, with which physicians help the patients understand and cope with the disease impacts hugely on quality of life. But also there are many things to uh, take into account, in particular, what type of information patients need. And summarizing a meta-analysis of many articles revealed that patients need information about, you know, cancer-related stuff but also the treatment, the prognosis, the rehabilitation. It's not so critical for CLL. But what about other things like body image and sexuality? Interpersonal, interpersonal and social information. Surveillance. So we need to address many things and we don't systematically do it, unfortunately. I'm showing you now part uh, preliminary results of an ongoing study, and I will close with this. It's an ongoing study at my institute. It's in collaboration with the King's College in London. It's a qualitative study of patients and physicians. The aims of the study is to explore how the patients experience illness and to identify needs with the healthcare context our aim is to try and make ends meet, and by that I mean help empower the patients, help the patients be active in the management of the disease, but this would be impossible if you don't train the physician. That's what we believed. So the finding so far that is that it is very difficult to accept a diagnosis of an incurable cancer with no symptoms and no need for treatment. This creates a cognitive dissonance, a major cognitive dissonance. And there are baffling thoughts. It's a leukemia. This is a horrible word. But we are telling our patients that in many cases, it may last for decades even without treatment. Then you may have physical symptoms, but your blood tests could be OK and vice versa. And then there may be a huge difference between how horrible you feel because you are diagnosed with a cancer and how well your examinations will be. 
Then the other thing is the problem with the continuous versus occasional presence of illness. The other major issue about whether to disclose or not disclose and the horrible fact, today you know that you have leukemia. You ask, about, you ask your physician about tomorrow and usually she or he will tell you, we don't really know. There are many identified needs. Holistic treatment is major and hon honesty is major. And we've also found that there are many coping mechanisms ranging from rationalization down to positive feeling towards the illness. There were some patients who told our psychologists, you know what, I think that this disease has made me a better person. So the role of the physician is to try to elicit and address symptoms that matter the most, use what the patients report about their quality of life to assess impact of new therapies. In other words, listen to the patient's voice. And I'm really glad that next year the European Union is launching a new initiative under the title Making Patients' Voice Heard in Medicine's Life Cycle. And we are really struggling together with Eric to include CLL as one case study. Also, being non-judgmental, elicit and address beliefs about medication, and support patients in medication management. This, of course, deals with health literacy and digital literacy. I will skip that because we will be talking a lot in the next two days, and also in the interest of time. Final thought, from, at least from our study. Patients will cope better if they experience high levels of social support from friends, from family, from illness groups, and from healthcare professionals. They will feel better if they have a better relationship with their physician, if they have accurate and adequate information, and if they understand their disease, thereby they can adhere better to the recommended measures, including their medication. I will stop here. I will thank you for your attention and be happy to try to answer your questions. Um, Costas, uh, thank you so much for um, your talk. You've given us a lot to consider there. Um, about. Can you hear now? Sorry. Um, Costas, you've given us a lot to consider there um, that we can work on over the next two and a half days. I have to make an official po apology. Um, I rushed things through. We're running out of time, but Costas, you've explained a bit about Eric. Just as a parting gesture before anyone, uh, I realise you introduced yourself and were introduced in the early session, but many here don't understand who you are can I and, and what Eric is. Yes, so. can I please have the final slide of my presentation? Okay, so Nick um, very correctly prompted me to say a bit more about ERIC. So ERIC is an acronym. Stands, this acronym stands for Chroni a European Research Initiative on CLL. It's a scientific working group of the European Hematology Association, and it's a scientific initiative with uh, scientists, it's physicians, but also uh, healthcare professionals working on CLL and related entities. The final slide, please. And we have more than 700 members in uh, 46 countries in Europe, the United States, Australia, uh, and we are expanding nicely. What we are trying to do is uh, reach consensus about the diagnostics in CLL, about what additional tests you need, about predicting how patients will respond to particular treatment. We are also now establishing a big, large 
pan-European database of patients with CLL, both in clinical trials, but also in general practice. And very, very recently, I mean, in last June, we decided in the board, you can see the other board members, Paolo Ghia is our president, Arnon Kather will be at attending this meeting, will be presenting a talk at this meeting, Carol Moreno, Sharka Pospisilova, and myself, uh, we are the board, the ERIC board, and we decided that we will be very active in projects dealing with patient empowerment. I have the honor uh, to be assigned this task of uh, being responsible for this type of activities, and which is why Nick and everyone here, I was very pleased to be attending this meeting because I think it's a good opportunity to learn more about your perceptions about what CLL is about and what the unmet needs are. <laughs>